All right, welcome to Bet the Edge. I'm Jay Croucher here with Drew Dinsick. We're going to be welcomed by Brad Thomas later in the show to talk uh, about Copper America and Euro 2024, mm. which is happening as we record on Monday afternoon. Uh, we will talk a little Stanley Cup Game 5. Uh, and we'll talk about the NBA Finals in a macro sense because we are recording before Game 5, so it may be over by the time you're listening to this. But I've got a few thoughts I want to get your, uh, I want to pick your brain on, Drew. But firstly, the US Open of golf, uh, Bryson DeChambeau wins uh, in epic fashion. It's probably the, I can't remember the last time I was so riveted by an event that I had no financial stake in. Um, as it came down to the wire between Rory and Bryson. So maybe a good sign for me as a, a human being, uh, my capacity to feel. Um, but what did you make of the tournaments? What did you make of the ending? And what, what do you make of pricing Rory McIlroy going forward now that he seems to have built up kind of su substantial melt equity? Yeah, rethink your uh, bottle factor uh for uh for rory mcelroy um holy smokes that was an entertaining finish um roy was incredible all day <laughs> until the bitter end and uh he put that run together on the back nine with the back-to-back -back birdies and just you know nine ten and then uh you know putting pressure on bryson and you know i think it was basically just a good lesson in you know you can throw out narrative for a lot of handicapping there's a lots of narrative talk that goes into putting together content around bet betting it's just kind of the you know part for the course because you want to make interesting content you don't want to be boring um but uh you know stuff in narrative in regards to the pressure of the moment and uh you know particularly with golf and tennis to a lesser degree when you're you're alone out there i mean yeah, i guess you have your caddy to at least communicate with um but you know you're in your own head standing over that uh you know three foot putt to effectively set up um either a win or uh you know at, at least a um uh you know bonus holes um and you know, the pressure obviously got to him and the pressure obviously got to Bryson too. Bryson, I felt like, did he hit a fairway the entire Sunday? Uh, you know, he was obviously feeling very, very, um, uh, you know, and this, these are both guys who have won this tournament. They've won, uh, you know, now multiple majors for for Bryson, but Rory's won three of the four uh, majors. And yet, uh, you know, the pressure is still a very, very difficult thing to uh, deal with, even at the highest level of the sport and, uh, you know, at the at the at the death of the tournament. And um yeah, I thought uh, the fact that you kind of see it coming down to a two-man race with the final nine holes to play, uh, that made for just outstanding drama. And then the ups and downs of, uh, you know, the missed putts, the lip outs, the, the drop shots from Bryson to really make it a, a, a thrilling ending uh, was incredible. And yeah, the bottle factor for Rory is, is very real. Uh, and I think it's pretty obvious that... He's going to have a tough time ever putting, you know, a stake through the heart of the, you know, the Masters, which we know is his way well. Uh, and he's going to have a tough time, I think, uh, you know, just in general, ending the drought, even as well as he was playing. Um, yeah, I thought he was the best golfer we saw. Uh, you know, Bryson got a lot of breaks in the earlier portion. I watched a lot of Bryson's golf because I had a little bit of a Calcutta equity in Bryson, so I cared about his his result ultimately. Um, and uh, uh, you know, Friday, Thursday, and Friday in particular, he had some very very lucky bounces. Um, and uh, he was scrambling out of the native area all it felt like the entire tournament and he scruffed you know he, he made it work uh, the course was incredible the drama that you know those greens set up for um, you know up and downs uh, to save yourself were, was just awesome and uh, I think they did an incredible job with the event um, I feel bad for anyone that had Rory equity if you had a pre-tournament or you bet them live, oh my goodness gracious! I uh, don't know how that doesn't get home. But uh, but Bryson hits you know his his 18th hole in particular was very very memorable. Um, and you know I was watching with uh, family who aren't especially into golf, and they were just absolutely riveted by the entire ending. So uh, well done to the sport. Yeah, the sand shot from Bryson on 18 is obviously an, an all timer. I think everyone who was watching that will probably remember it for. Uh, a long time to come. I think Rory got into minus 600 uh, when he had yeah. the two-stroke lead towards the end, going into the last three holes or so. It is interesting with the 
um, the bottle factor, the melt equity, the DAC <laughs> equity, um, the Zverev <laughs> equity, where it, it's, I mean, it's so difficult to price in real time. So I would have been yeah. anything that last US Open, that Wyndham Clark was going to bottle it. Yeah. And then he just had ice water in his veins to make those two clutch putts at the end to Stonewall, Rory McIlroy, uh, ironically. But you could just kind of tell the way that Rory was moving around. The, also, the way that Bryson was like, revving up the crowd like he didn't seem nervous whatsoever it almost <laughs> felt like it had gone too far the other way with him um but no it was an amazing spectacle um very good for the sport uh and for anyone who hasn't seen it um and, and a lot of people probably have by now johnson wagner did um an incredible four minute segment on golf channel with bryson dechambeau recreating his um recreating the sand shot at the end um mm -hmm. which is about the best golf content um, I've ever seen uh, really, really good. Johnson's incredible. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with him um, a bit on Golf Channel, and he's he's fantastic. And uh, and it's a really good segment. You know, ironically, Drew, um, the Sunday night after the U.S. Open last year, uh, Johnson Wagner was uh, having a beer with me at uh, Bobby <laughs> B's in Stanford. And uh, this U.S. Open Sunday night, he's having a beer with Bryson DeChambeau. So you could say that uh, Johnson Wagner is, is trending up. Um, I'd rather um, have a beer with you than Bryson. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah, you can talk about Jalen Brown finals MVP or win the US Open either way. Um, but no, that's a really, really good clip, and I recommend that um, everyone give it a watch. Anyway, segueing seamlessly into Jalen Brown and his pals, uh, mm. not going to talk about the game or re uh, in advance and retrospectively at the same time predict game five, but I wanted to get your thoughts on just how this series has been priced. Because to recap, so games one and two in Boston, line closed about Boston minus 6.75. Then game three in Dallas with no poor zingers, Mavs minus 2.75. Game four, Celtics with a 3-0 lead, uh, are one and a half point favorites with Chris Stapps uh, available in specific circumstances, never ends up seeing the floor. And then game five, now like it opened Boston minus seven and a half. Now it's down to more like six and a half. To me, just the wild swings in how this series has been priced kind of gives rise to the idea that maybe it's not actually the most efficient liquid market <laughs> on earth. The way I just can't buy that going from game three to game four, that can be more than like a four point swing based on the vague idea that Dallas is definitely or Dallas are heavy favorites to just pack it in. When I'm pretty sure, you know, it's the NBA finals. Like, I don't think they want to get swept. And I think they're going to give Max F. So anyway, what do you think about how this series has been priced? It's been confusing uh, for sure. But there's a lot of examples through um, NBA playoff history of similar stuff happening. And um, you just have to, you know, navigate it uh, to the degree possible with the positions you set up pre-tournament, uh, pre-series. pre, uh, pre -series. Um, And yeah, I took a little bit of uh, skin off uh on betting some mavericks on uh um man what day was that now <laughs> friday <laughs> these th these gaps of time are tough but uh yeah i you know i took a little skin off in game four um with some mavericks just because you know it it it, it felt realistic like uh um the celtics were you know if they if they got punched early which has been the case in a lot of these games they were just going to kind of regroup for game five as opposed to you know leaving it on the court and really creating a situation where the door is open for the mavericks to come back in the series and i think that's mostly what you saw um this series has reminded me so much of uh the western conference finals two years ago with the warriors and the mavericks um and just sort of how the markets treated them you know how it's played out uh, everything is, is feels uh, just very, very similar. And, you know, the experience that the Celtics now have having gone through uh, a few of these runs, I think is, is you know, it's, it's shining through. Um, and uh, yeah, I would expect uh, the next time we talk, we're, we're, we're celebrating Banner 18. Okay. Well, let us pray. I think to me, the difference is um, with this series and compared to other series where a team has kind of just, you know, been down 3-0 and then gotten the game four kind of token victory before getting destroyed in game five is that there has been a material change in the series where Chris Tapps Porzingis, right. who is, it, for my money, the second best player on the Celtics, 
Uh, I mean, I, I we don't know what's going to happen as we're recording now. Don't know his status. I'd be shocked if he plays and is like 100% effective, though. And that changes the complexion of the series because if you don't have Chris Tapps Porzingis, then this is basically the same team as last year, maybe a slightly even worse team than last year when you think that, yes, you have Drew Holiday, but like Marcus Smart, Rob Williams, Malcolm Brogdon, Grant Williams, those guys were all good and they were all helpful <laughs> for this Boston team and they're not there anymore. And so the team doesn't have a great deal of depth. Um, ultimately, it's just so hard even still without Paul Zingas to beat this Boston team three times in a row. Like there will just be very likely there will be a game where the shots just fall for Boston or they find something schematically that just happens to work for that game or they just bring a lot more effort in a given game. So anyway, we'll see. Can't talk too much about the series as it may be over by the time you're listening to this, but I do think it is just an interesting um, one to reflect on with how it's been priced. Like I personally, like seven and a half, like I don't understand how the line opened seven and a half, like the games no one and two were minus 6.75 with Chris Dapps in. Now you could say that, okay, those were probably just bad lines. Like it should have been seven and a half back then. And maybe there's been an adjustment now, but yeah, I don't, I don't think there is a massive gap between these two teams um, when Chris Stapps is out. Like I think, I think there is a small gap, but the thing that made it to me very one-sided coming into the series was Chris Stapps Porzingis and the idea that, you know, he is going to be playing 25 minutes and be, you know, at least 80% of himself or so. And, and that bore out in the first two games where Boston crushed them in the Chris Stapps minutes and then basically played them to more or less a draw in the non Chris Stapps minutes. Well, now if you're playing them to a draw in the non Chris Stapps minutes and there's no Chris Stapps and there's the Tillman minutes instead, uh, it can get a little dicey. But anyway, we'll talk about the series um, in greater detail when uh, it is either over or whether, uh, God forbid, it is extended to a game six. If it gets extended to a game six, oh it is going to get very uh i look, i don't i want the series over for my financial positions i've just got a soft spot for this celtics team beyond that though it is mainly about the financial positions 97 <laughs> but it will be incredible human drama if this goes to a game seven can you imagine that like tatum oh. and brown in a oh, game no. seven uh having don't dropped three straight it'll be an all-time nba game that uh i pray to god we'd never see um but anyway we'll we'll tackle that if it comes <laughs> In the meantime, the toughest cycling race of the year is back. Drew, the Ooh. Tour de France, takes the world's top cyclists on a mountainous 21-day journey, stream exclusive coverage all race long starting Saturday, June 29th at 6.30 a.m. Eastern on Peacock. Mm. Unlike the uh, Slovenian uh, Luka Doncic, I think the Slovenian Tade Pogacar mm. uh, has a realistic chance of finishing first instead of runner up this time so excited for the tour de france to start but uh god so much drama so many good sports on right now you've been watching yeah. any of the uh, the olympic trials for swimming are going on right now oh i haven't gosh. gotten into that yet but i've heard electric a lot of, uh, yeah second hand there's electric going on yeah it's uh, not reagan <laughs> reagan smith uh swim the fifth fastest hundred fly ever for a woman not going to the Olympics because two women were ahead of her. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, the drama is she'll, she'll still make it in the backstroking events, but uh, yeah, the, the drama of the qualifying process is just incredible to watch. Okay. Well, another uh, big event that is taking place on frozen water uh, on the ice, the Stanley <laughs> Cup Finals, which is still going. Uh, it's been extended to game five after um, the Panthers shipped eight in game four. Uh, and now still Panthers, still massive favorites, minus 1,200. The Oilers plus 725 to actually win the Cup. Game five, though, um, kind of the pricing speaks to the fact that, you know, these teams are pre fairly evenly matched, and it's just home ice that is flipping the pricing in given games. Panthers minus 135, Oilers plus 115 on the money line. Uh, the total is five and a half, slightly juiced to the under. Uh, what do you think of this game and the state of the series? Well, uh, unlike the NBA, where you know I see pretty substantial momentum swing for the home team coming home trying to you know close out the series, I worry a little bit that um, the you know the Oilers and you know really just in general the fact that their offense got going, the fact that uh, you know you had a little bit of confidence issues with uh, Bobrovsky for the Panthers, uh, you know that that can linger. 
Um, and I don't know that, uh, you know, there's there. I don't know that this series is over. Uh, I haven't given up on my Oilers position at all. <laughs> I think there's a chance they could make this interesting. Uh, and, uh, you know, it all comes down to if their goaltending and their defense, if, you know, the improvements you saw in game four, if that carries forward, because the, the defense that uh, the Edmonton had in game three was just on another level poor compared to what I saw in game four. Um, and, uh, you know, I think ultimately this could deck, you know, that, that game four result could be the momentum shift needed to at least make this an interesting series. Um, I think this is still probably going six or seven. I don't have a strong inclination to get involved anymore on the money line for the Edmonton uh, Oilers at this point at plus 115 range. But uh, if it drifts anymore, I would give it some serious consideration. And I think maybe the over is the better look. Because again, like I don't really believe in the defense that we saw from Edmonton in game four, but I definitely believe that the, uh, you know, the confidence issues could, could uh, haunt Bobrovsky. Uh, in the, in game five and, and maybe even beyond. So, um, yeah, I think this is, uh, I think the Stanley Cup finals has a little bit more drama left in store for us. Yeah, potentially. I think the two, the two good things on Edmonton's side are one, Bobrovsky, very shaky, uh, getting pulled halfway through the second period after shipping what, five goals uh, yep. before he got pulled. And Bobrovsky, who he had stretches last year where he's playing like the highest level I've ever seen from a goal where he's just like, all right, you're just, you're just going to lose Carolina. You just got no chance in the Eastern Conference Finals because he's just turned uh, into a Greek god. Um, but it does, it can turn with him. Um, and I think people forget like, he wasn't even the goalie going into round one last year. Uh, it was line because he just wasn't yeah. in, he just it wasn't playing well. He's dealing with some health stuff as well, but it, it can turn quickly for goalie. So that would be the one thing. And then the second thing is, and Connor McDavid talked about this a little bit, which I haven't really tested statistically, but it would make sense to me that the longer the series goes, the more Edmonton will figure out their power play and figure out how to solve Florida's um, penalty kill because that is what elevates Edmonton into you know a super special realm. This all world power play that just hasn't surfaced at all in the Stanley Cup Finals yet. Now they scored one in Game Four, but it was five on three, so it doesn't really count as much. But I just think that the way that Edmonton struggled early in the series against Dallas. Um, with the man advantage and the way that by the end of it, I think they scored on four of their last five, four of their last six power plays against Dallas um, and seem to have figured it out. Just the longer the series goes, the more looks that you give McDavid and Dreisaitl and Bouchard on that power play, um, then I think that potentially could bode a little poorly for Florida. Um, and I think these teams are pretty evenly matched and these are three, it's going to be three, you know, around coin flips and Edmonton doesn't take a ton to just land Edmonton three times in a row. To me, the most interesting way to bet this uh, series, though, is the Con Smythe market, which I still think is backwards, hmm. where Sergei Bobrovsky is still the favorite. He's minus 115. Uh, Alexander Barkov plus 135. Connor McDavid, six to one. There's still some seven to one on McDavid. I think Barkov should be the favorite. I don't think it's a lock or anything, but I think that he should be, uh, he should have a minus in front of his number thing with Bobrovsky is that like, his case just isn't very good. And putting aside my own personal position on Barkov, like Bobrovsky, he has a 90.9 save percentage, which is not great. 2.27 goals um, allowed per game, which is which is good, but not otherworldly, like we've seen with previous goalies to win the Conn Smythe. And then his advanced numbers, like per 60, in terms of his goals saved above expected in the playoffs, he ranks 11th among goalies. Like he's really just living off the game one against Edmonton, where admittedly he was, you know, a hundredth percentile performance. He was magnificent. It was one game for a playoff yeah. long award. Whereas Barkov is leading the team in points. He's the captain of the team. He's considered the best player on the team. He has a defensive reputation, which elevates him well beyond his point total. And then the, the main thing really is that like, it doesn't really matter what I think. Like, just listen to what voters are saying. And from everything I've heard and discerned, like Barkov is the guy right now and he should be the favorite. Um, what is interesting, most interesting to me, though, in a way, is do you think that uh, Connor McDavid could win um, if the Panthers win the series? Oh, no, right now, you know? right now huh. he has 38 points and Barkov has 21. 
And Bob Ross, he just doesn't have a great case for mine. So, look, if it's a five-game series, McDavid's not going to win because like, I just don't think you can win if you get stomped in five games in the in the cup finals. But if it goes six, and particularly if it goes seven, and McDavid has, like, doubled Barkov's points, mm. which is diff- very difficult to do. But it could be scenarios where McDavid has, like, 45 points, which I believe would be the second most in NHL playoff history. If he has, mm. like, 45 points in games in a Game 7 uh, in a seven-game loss, while Barkov has like 23 or 24, and everyone just agrees that McDavid was the best guy in the playoffs, like I think there are worlds where he could win. That's an interesting take. I honestly, I didn't think that there were we were ever going to live in a uh, you know in a universe where we were going to give a losing player an MVP. But this is you know the Smythe is a playoffs long award, and that there are other. Uh, considerations. I certainly agree with you that the top is backwards. Um, and I was actually going <laughs> to ask you if there was a case to be made for Gustav Forsling, uh, who leads the uh, the Panthers in plus minus. He's amazingly plus 13 throughout the playoffs for this team somehow when you know Barkov is only a plus two. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the key is and, and what is opening the door for a McDavid shocker would be that that really like the the clear and obvious candidates for your likely cup winner right now, Florida Panthers aren't that strong. Uh, and there, there's holes. Uh, and I don't know that the voters have, you know, kind of fully, you know, cooked where they're going here. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I definitely like the idea of taking advantage of the fact that those two prices at the top look wrong. <laughs> yep. He's yeah. My way to bet this series now would I would, I would bet Barkov at price, um, and I would bet McDavid at price. I think McDavid's price should now clearly be shorter. Well, wow. I mean, it should be shorter than Edmonton's cup price because he is now like the Evan Bouchard ship has sailed. The Leon Drysaddle ship never really, um, it never really took to water, um, and McDavid is like pretty close to. I mean, he's effectively a hundred percent of Edmonton's equity, and I think that particularly if it goes seven. I think there is a real chance that he could win in a losing effort. And the thing is with this, um, as Chris Judd winning for Norm Smith medal for the West Coast Eagles in the 2005 AFL Grand Final drew, Mm -hmm. I think there is an element of if you're going to give it to the guy on the losing team, they kind of have to be an all-time great for the most part. And Connor McDavid certainly ticks the box. No one will have any issue, I don't think, with Connor McDavid winning the Con Smythe uh, in a losing effort. And it has been done before, not in a long time, but it has been done before. Uh, so I think that, that that is in play. I don't. I think it's no chance if it's in five. I think it's a tiny chance if it's in six. And I think it's a real chance if they lose in seven. Um, so, okay. so that would be my bet. I love All it. right. Uh, before we bring in Brad Thomas, the best American athletes look to punch their tickets to the Paris Olympics, the U.S. Olympics team trials, part of Making Team USA, Sunday, 8 Eastern on NBC and Peacock. All right, let's bring in Brad Thomas um, to talk a little Copa America and Euro 2024. Happy Father's Day, Brad, belated for uh, Sunday, now that you're part of the, the girl. You as well, club. man, you as well. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Um, let's start off with uh, the Copa America, uh, where Argentina predictably are your favourites at plus 175, Brazil plus 225, then Uruguay uh, kind of tier two by themselves at five to one. And then you have Colombia, Mexico, and the USA uh, all at 12 to one. Um, perhaps before we jump into that, are there any group markets that you like at the moment? Yeah, I think the only two group markets I'd play, number one, I'd play uh, Uruguay to win their group at minus 145. Mm-hmm. That team is just so talented. Um, not only are they do they have the talent, um, but they are well coached, right? There's a massive, massive coaching advantage when you look at uh, Bielsa versus what, Garnado, uh, Greg Bolholt, a wrong group. Uh, um, excuse me about that. Christensen, uh uh, Antonio Carlos, Burhalter, Bielsa, like right, you tear those, you tear those guys up, and you're like, wow, Uruguay's coach is so much better. But not only that, they play a really like free form, free flowing football, which helps you in tournaments against teams that struggle to score. Um, and also their pathway to win this group, like they have to beat Bolivia, they beat Panama, and then just hope that you United States doesn't just rack up goals against uh, Panama and Bolivia. And I think they they could do that, right? It's minus 145, um, very, very likely to happen. 
Uh, but what else? I, I also like um, Ecuador to win their group. And mm. it. I think, honestly, the wrong team is favored here, right? Like Mexico gets a little bit of a boost for this being in the United States. So obviously uh, the games will have crazy Mexican fans excited uh, to root on their national team, but their golden generations kind of pass them by. Um, they don't have uh, quality players who are playing in big uh, European leagues. Uh, most of them are playing in Mexico, no disrespect, but it's just a talent uh, differential. Ecuador is a really well-coached team as well um, with Felix Sanchez as their coach. If you guys remember, he he coached at Qatar, made that really bad Qatar team pretty good, but they weren't good because they had a bunch of talented players. Um, and then on the flip side of what my argument for Uruguay, this Ecuador team is so strong defensively and the way they line up and this, this is getting in the weeds a little bit, but the way they line up gives them the flexibility to play really good defense and beat you with pace. And what I mean by that uh, four, two, three, one is probably how they're going to line up in most, most matches, but they're two midfielders uh, that they, they have the ability to kind of pull in deep and support the back line, or they can pull, push out wide um, and, and move down the pitch and that can change that fluidity that can change. It helps either kind of situation if they're chasing a game or they're locking it back in. And I, I just think they have some really good quality um, inner Valencia. It might be 50 years old, but the dude can score. Um, we've seen what Caicedo has been able to do with Chelsea. I think that Mexico team is only getting the boost because they're, they're L3, right? They're, they're Mexico. They're getting that, that extra love from the name brand recognition. Mm, okay. Very interesting. I like those takes. Uh, do you feel strongly enough about Uruguay that they could prevent this from being sort of same old, same old Brazil, Argentina final? Well, um, you know, Uruguay would be my, my pick to win, right? They, uh, oh. they're tied with, uh, Argentina to, uh, with the most Copa America title. So I believe it's 15, but I, their pathway is really difficult, right? So I, I built up my bracket, um, uh, Uruguay would have to play Colombia in round one if everything goes the way I predicted it. Colombia is good enough to win their group. Let's say Colombia wins their group, then they have to play Brazil in the quarterfinals, and then whoever they don't play, they're probably going to have to play in the semifinals, whereas you have a team like Argentina who just kind of coasts their way to the finals, which you know the storybook is made that way. But yeah, they, they are coming in really good form, and, and luckily for them, um, the United States, not the United States, excuse me, Brazil, aren't coming in with good form. Uh, Ronaldinho, and even though he said afterwards he was joking, he said, this is the worst Brazil team I've seen in a very long time. And I don't think it's that they're the worst. We have to remember they didn't have a coach until January, right? Like they're putting pieces together. It's hard to just flip on these tactics and play in a serious tournament just six months later. Yeah, Ronald Daniel really went uh, wild at Brazil. I'm not sure if there's been a falling out there or something. Uh, I'm guessing there has because he he really unleashed. Um, in terms of uh, a couple of ways to bet Argentina, if if one likes Argentina to win the tournament, Brad, would you rather back uh, Argentina plus 175 to win the whole thing or Lionel Messi to be the top goal scorer at plus 300? Argentina to win the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I actually think Argentina are in a pretty good situation to where they won't have to just burn the tread on, on Messi, right? They have a lot of really good scoring talent and they have players who can come in for Messi. Let's say they, they dominate their group. Like no one's really that high on Canada this year. Canada probably could finish last or third. Um, I, uh, Peru, uh, not all that great. And then, uh, then you have Chile who they're plus 100 to advance. It just kind of tells you, um, how this group is. We see this this uh, this Argentinian Argentinian side with not only the issue of Messi might not play every game or they might not even need to try. And I hate that saying because teams always try, but it's the only way I think that Americans, us Americans can really understand how soccer works, where um, if they're going to sit deeper, that's the same thing as basically not trying to most American fans. They're not going to go after games and chase them. Um, but when you look at the other golden boot guys or my favorite golden boot guy in Darwin Nunez, he doesn't have all these other guys on his team that can score or are going to be playing for him. So I'd rather bet Argentina to win, win the, win the cup. And listen, Argentina has the easiest pathway, like we said, and they're probably going to win it. But Jay, I'm not placing one plus 175 for someone to win a tournament before the whole thing's even started. Okay. Fair enough. Um, 
Let's uh, pivot to Euro. We want your take on a couple things. So we're underway. Um, and the most obvious takeaway for me so far has been this has been kind of free flowing, a little exhibition, a whiff of exhibition so far. Uh, a lot of early goals in these games. We're just finally starting to see a couple unders come through. This is what the first two unders of the entire tournament uh, here on uh, Monday afternoon. But, um, you know, what what have you made so far of what you've seen uh, so far uh, on the pitch in uh, in, in Europe? It's been sickening. Uh, sickening <laughs> is probably the best way to describe it. I think people forget that tournaments like this are like all-star games. And what I mean by that is these guys play all year round on their domestic, domestic leagues, and then they come together during international breaks, change tactics, a lot of them changing positions, and then they we expect them to put together this beautiful, free-flowing, stringing football but that doesn't happen. Uh, we also mix in nerves. Uh, a lot of nerves happen. It's also been sickening because I like betting unders in tournaments. Uh, mm -hmm. We went two days without an under hitting. And to make it worse, to add insult to injury, every first half over hit, if you took the under <laughs> in every single game after the second goal was scored, the live under, you cashed. So that means if you had full game over, pre full game over pregame, you're cashing. Full game under, you're losing. But if you're smart enough to bet the live under, which no one ever does, you win. <laughs> or if you bet the live over, like everyone does, you lose. The books are cleaning up. <laughs> Yeah, that's uh, is that sometimes that's, just uh, I think that's, that's soccer, soccer, right? Yeah. <laughs> that's soccer betting, um, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> from what I've seen of the tournament so far, I think Germany have been the most impressive team, certainly relative to England. Like, just head to head, I would prefer to take Germany to win the tournament over England. Uh, I think that they have unlocked um, some elements with just structure. Tony Cruz being there is super helpful for them. England as well. It's just always such a slog for them. I don't know why they just don't yeah. win matches easily. They have so much talent, but I just don't really rate Southgate that highly. As we're speaking, France are kind of grinding out a 1-0 win over Austria. It's 1-0 in the 79th minute. Uh, again, like just the Deschamps is similar to Southgate in a way where he has all this amazing offensive talent and then it's just content to play an extremely defensive style. Um, but Germany on home soil um, with the attacking talent they have, they're just extremely well-rounded. Um, so I, I think I would take them as the favorites to win it all. But mm -hmm. Brad, I'm keen for your thoughts on two teams in particular that are hard for me to get a handle on. Those are Spain and Belgium. Uh, I'm not sure how much you caught of the Belgium game earlier today, but... I thought they played really well, um, but the curse of Romelu Lukaku, uh, <laughs> Romelu McElroy, um, just struck, and he just, he just, he just God will not allow him to find the back of the net, or it, w it will allow him to find the back of the net, but it will not count, where he had two goals ruled out, one with a very contentious handball that I don't agree with, um, and I just horrible. feel like shouldn't be... Like I'm, I'm just done with VAR. Like, just give me human frailty. I'm fine with human error. Like, that's yep. way better than whatever these random technicalities are, where the ball, yeah, brushed his hand, but it just didn't have any impact on anything. Like, just play on. Um, but anyway, Belgium, do you think that they can turn it around? And then, secondly, Spain were very impressive against Croatia. They are loaded with attacking talent. They're just loaded in talent in general. Their press seemed a little bit off, like Croatia had some chances. But what do you think of those two teams? Um, Belgium, I don't think they stand a chance. Um, and it's they have you know some really good talent on the team, but I just think defensively and in the midfield, they have a lot of issues. When you have a team that's struggling defensively, especially since they want to play out the back, right? You're going to have to cover a lot of weak spots. How are you going to do that? What they've been doing is, or at least they did in game one, is they use Kevin De Bruyne as the guy, the kind of like the Band-Aid. But then that takes away from his creativity in servicing guys like Lukaku. Um, it, it just doesn't make sense. I also think they kind of outcoached themselves a little bit earlier. You have uh, Jeremy Doku, who is a pacey left winger. Uh, you have the opportunity to play him against a 37-year-old defender. But then you decide not to play him on the left wing and you play him at the right wing against a 27 year old and you put uh Trossard out to the, out to the left, like things like that. Just they do that consistently in tournaments, right? They're these great friendly, this great friendly team blow teams out in friendlies. But when the tournaments come, they can't score because I think they're so worried about these different tactics, or even if it's something as small as like the golden generations passing them by and it's just pressure whatever it is they're not clean and that's tough for me um the other team spain i have spain to uh make it to the semifinals really talented team um they have a good mixture of uh veteran leadership but 
also a lot of youth that is kind of being injected. Uh, Jamal Musiala, 16 year old, uh, youngest uh, player to ever start in a, um, a Euro match. Uh, the dude is just really ice uh, with his feet. Marata, if he's uh, um, if he's just making these runs and Lemire Mall is going to uh, continue to make these passes, he's going to score. I think the biggest problem for Murata and what we've seen time and time again is he feels like he has to kind of do too much because he's not getting great service. Um, but when you're getting passes from, from you all, it's, it's really, really nice. And we didn't even see a nice game out of Pedri, right? Out of Pedri, excuse me. And that's just another guy who's going to be even better. Or if they have issues in, in the midfield and they just make subs, I think their team's really deep. Um, and they kind of got away from the death by a thousand passes, which helps. Yeah, it was a very unusual kind of statistical uh, out, you know, for the the, stat, the stats from that uh, Croatia Spain game just didn't yep. really compute with any of my my and my priors for, for either team. I was like, wow, okay. Um, but uh, yeah, that all makes sense. I'm with Jay, Germany for me. Uh, and I know it's easy to say that having you know a, just an absolute stomping of the poor Scots on uh, uh, on the opening match, but uh, boy, do they support their home team and yeah. uh, in Deutschland, and it's, it's cool to watch. And uh, yeah, I mean, France right now scuffling hard. Uh, the one own goal by uh, Austria, the difference to this point in the matches is, is amazing. Maybe France, uh, you know, kind of dealing with what you were laying out there at the beginning, which is just, they don't really have much cohesion right now. Uh, maybe the deeper we get into this tournament the, the uh, that changes a bit but um anything um anything that you've seen in terms of how this is shaping up for um you know a, a bracket and uh and group winners that uh sends you in any given direction in the futures pool for either to win outright or the top goal scores yeah the, it, it's wide open for top goal scores and Bappe hasn't scored Kane hasn't scored uh Ronaldo hasn't played Lukaku hasn't scored Bellingham scored but I don't think that's going to continue that team uh, just, I don't, I don't think they understand where they want players. That's another situation where Foden's playing out of position. I think Bellingham should actually be playing deeper to allow Foden to play up, which helps them a little bit. I'd mm -hmm. probably put a little bit on Havertz, right? Um, he's not going to play every single game. Uh, I mean, excuse me, every single minute, uh, he'll be kind of switching off with full Krug. But what I like about Kai Havertz is unlike a lot of these guys, like, uh, what we've seen so far, and this is, we're only halfway through this first like group stage, this first round of group stage matches is he's actually coming to the ball, which kind of makes him uh, a little more dangerous. He gets more touches, more opportunities to get into a game. When you have like Harry Kane, who's not coming to the ball and he's only getting one or two touches in, in 90 minutes, it's hard to grow into a game and, and kind of be lethal. But again, you know, with these premium strikers, all they need is one touch, one great service in, the, in their scoring. So, but I think uh, Kai Havertz is a, is a good look if you want to take anyone live. Yeah, the good thing with Havertz too, and what is always key in these top goal scorer markets is he does take Germany's penalties yes. um, as he did uh, against Scotland, which is which is very key. Um, on the Spain, their game style aspect, I can't remember the exact stat off the top of my head, but I believe that game against Croatia was the first uh, that first match in like 137 where Spain had less completed <laughs> yes. passes um, yeah. than the opposition, which is <laughs> which is insane, but speaks to I think a probably a positive change in the way that they play. The team just makes a lot more sense than even um, it did two years ago with the World mm -hmm. Cup. Um, just last thing to round off the Belgium point, Brad. I think the sneaky thing with Belgium is that. He's not he's not washed, but Kevin De Bruyne is not the same guy that he was um, even like two years ago where he turns 33 in two weeks. I didn't think he had a very good season with Man City, even though they won the title. He was injured, came back, thought he was pretty poor against Real Madrid in the mm -hmm. second leg of that Champions League tie that they ended up losing on penalties. He just doesn't have the same touch or verve at the moment and he is getting older and he's dealt with a ton of injuries. So, uh, and if he's not, if he's not, you know, you see, I think he was a top three, top four player in the world and he's not that at the moment. Uh, and if he's not, then this Belgium team um, looks a lot weaker um, on paper and in reality. Um, cool. All right. Well, that wraps us up. Um, everyone can follow Brad at Mr. Brad Thomas on Twitter slash X. Um, anything that you want to uh, plug Brad? Uh, yeah, um, just continue. Like you said, follow me on X and Twitter. I'm trying to have a game, at least one bet for every game and then a halftime report for every game, which will give you like live, li live possibilities or at least a breakdown of what to expect and what's happening. Okay, brilliant. Thanks very much for joining us, Brad. Uh, we are done for today. We will be back 
tomorrow to break down uh, the NBA Finals. Uh, I really don't want to be previewing a game six, um, but if we have to do it, we will. Um, but anyway, uh, Godspeed to the Boston Celtics. Close it out. Don't forget to check out NBCSports.com for more information to help you with your wages. Thanks to those watching on the NBC Sports YouTube channel. And if you're listening to us in podcast form, don't forget to rate and subscribe. And a reminder to find all your favorite NBC Sports shows on Amazon Music. Just head to Amazon.com slash NBC Sports. I'm Jay Croucher, Drew Dinsick, Brad Thomas. Thanks for listening. We'll see you soon.